And I want to talk this morning about broken systems. So we see here Jeremiah, last time we'd seen his call that the Lord had, had spoken to him and he tested him. So just like you might perhaps put a telephone wire into a house and you might test it to see if it's working. But once it's up and running, it's ready for calls. The Lord had tested his prophet and now Jeremiah was ready to transmit what the Lord wanted to say to his people. So we see there verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. So it's to go into the, the heart, the capital of Judah and to declare God's word. And as we've just seen, as Margaret's just read to us, um, it's not a kind of soft, comforting word that the Lord wants to bring to his people through Jeremiah on this occasion. But it's a hard word in a sense. It's a word of accusation. It's a word really speaking to the unfaithfulness of God's people. And that's the stories we read right through the scriptures. You know, we see God doing amazing things for his people. But yet there's something in the heart of particularly the Old Testament believers that always led them away to unfaithfulness. And the picture that the Lord uses is one of marriage. He's seeing Israel and Judah as, as an unfaithful spouse. The picture of marriage, you know, marriage is such a precious thing. This is why marriage is so under attack throughout every generation, but particularly in our generation, is that marriage, that relationship between one man and one woman coming together, as it says in Ephesians chapter 5, is a picture, a relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and his people, the church. So we see this wonderful picture of marriage all the way through. And it's a marriage of the divine to the human. How we can come as human beings into that loving relationship with God himself. So in our chapter, chapter 2, there are really just a series of accusations about Judah's unfaithfulness. In chapter 3, it kind of spills over, but the... the uh, the chapter division's there, and there is a, a point in a sense, because then it goes on to ask the question, in a sense, can this marriage, which has become so stained, can it be saved? The wonderful answer is, as you read throughout, I don't want to give this any spoilers away in case you've never read the rest of the Bible, yeah? But hallelujah, yes it can, and right at the end in... Revelation 19, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Hallelujah. This wonderful picture that's right through the theme of the Bible of sinful mankind rebelling against God but being redeemed and brought into that loving relationship as a bride is now clean and ready for that marriage supper with Jesus Christ himself. So yes, it can be redeemed, but in this particular time, the scene here in chapter 2, really, is like a, a law court. There's a series of accusations that the Lord brings, questions that he brings, as if Jude is on trial before God himself. Depending on which version of the Bible you read, there's up to 19 questions here that the Lord comes accusing Judah who stood in the dock. There's no defence. There'll be no defence for us when we stand before the Lord. The Lord brings the questions, but he also brings the answers. There is no defence. So here is the Lord coming. You know, it's good for us to allow the Lord to judge us. It's good to come and, and to read our Bibles and not just to read it, just to think, oh, I'm just having a bit of a quiet time with God and I just, just read it quickly. Oh, that's, that felt nice. You know, I'm going to have a coffee now and move on with my day. But to allow the Word of God, the Spirit of God, through the Word of God to search us, to test us. You know, we're not like, unlike God's people in the Old Testament. Our hearts can drift away from God so easily. But what a wonderful thing it is when the Lord comes and searches us 
and asks those accusing questions. Because he wants to highlight our sin, not to condemn us, but to set us free. This is how we grow in holiness with the Lord. As he searches us, we see our great want and we say, Sorry, Lord, please change me. And he graciously does and makes us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord comes. Let me read one question that he brings. Verse 29. Why do you contend with me? You have all transgressed against me, declares the Lord. You know, all the world's problems originate in, from human sin. All the world's problems. You know, you read Genesis 1 and 2, without sin, it's glorious, perfect. Genesis chapter 3, it comes in. Man's rebellion against God, mankind's sin. This is the thing, we, we often try and cover our sin and hide away from our sin. But this, the point is, is that, that when something bad's happening, ultimately <clears throat> it's because of human sin. It might be ours directly in that situation or somebody else's. But ultimately that's the problem and this is the thing, this is why our loving Father sent such a Saviour Jesus to set us free from these things. But the central accusation here is that the Lord highlights through Jeremiah two evils. Verse 13, if you'd like to look at that. My people have committed two evils. Firstly, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And secondly, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. One feeds the other. As human beings, we're made to worship. If we're not worshipping the Lord, if we forsake the Lord, then our hearts will go after and worship other things. The picture here, the fountain. So if you think of a spring in a valley, giving cool water out, fresh water being poured out. But this is more than that. This is a fountain. It's not just seeping out the hillside like a spring might. Fountains gush up. They overflow. This is the picture, this is what God's saying. I'm like a fountain. I'm the fountain of life. You can come to me at any time and I'll never dry up. You can drink of me. I will satisfy. You can drink of me. You won't be harmed in any way. There's nothing bad about this fountain. Comparing it to a cistern, which is a hole in the ground dug by a person or a number of people to try and collect rainwater during the rainy season so that when it's dry, they can go down and take water out for their needs. You know, there's only ultimately two ways to live in life. You're either living for Jesus Christ, surrendered to his will and living for his glory, or you're living for yourself, surrendered to nobody, and living for your own glory. They're the only two options that we've got. And the accusation that the Lord's bringing is that God's people had stopped living God's way and were living their own way. And you can feel something of the outrage in this. The imagery that the Lord speaks through Jeremiah so there's this outrage that comes. If you look at verse 32. Can a virgin forget her ornament or a bride her attire? Do married women ever forget their engagement ring? Does the bride forget her wedding dress? Verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods. You can feel the outrage. The Lord's saying, why have I been slighted? Why are you been so unfaithful to me? I've only given you good all the time. Why is it that you've gone away and you've even forget, forgot those things? You've forgotten as if I even exist. You've forgotten your wedding dress. You've forgotten your engagement ring. It's like a, a, we never had this relationship. That's the outrage that's coming through, through the words of Jeremiah. The nation had become apostate. That is, it had fallen away from the living God. It had fallen away from the faith. 
Now, not everyone, because clearly Jeremiah hadn't. But as a whole, the nation had fallen away from God. We live in a time, particularly in our nation, in the Western world, where the church is just, in many ways, the established church, a lot of the denominations, are becoming apostate. They're falling away from that faith once delivered to the saints. Coming away from the truth of the Bible. Drifting away. Falling away. Naming God, in a sense, but not really the God that they're naming. doesn't really have any bearing with the God who's revealed in the Scriptures. It's a God of their own imagination. It's not everyone, not every church, but that some of our denominations, sadly, are falling away. Why does this happen? How does this happen? Well, our text shows, really, that in the accusations that the Lord brings, it shows how a nation, how a denomination can fall away from the living God. And the first thing I want to bring, bring out is that they'd forgotten all the good things that God had done. Verse 6, have a look. It says, Your fathers did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt? It goes on to talk about coming through the wilderness and settling in the promised land. The fathers hadn't passed it down to the next generations of the goodness of God, the deliverance, the coming out of the, the, the power of Pharaoh, all the miracles setting them free from Egypt, coming through the Red Sea. I mean, that's a pretty good one to tell your children, your grandkids. The Lord opened up a sea, let God's people pass through, and then he closed it in again on their enemies. They'd forgotten these things. They'd forgotten the manna. They'd forgotten the quail. They'd forgotten the water in the wilderness. They'd forgotten that God had brought them into a land that they hadn't worked for. A land that already had houses, already had vineyards. A land that was flowing with milk and honey. They'd forgotten these things. You know, the job of whoever stands here where I am today, primarily on a Sunday morning, is to remind you again of God, who he is and what he's done. You know, the job of parents primarily is to remind their children, to tell their children of who God is and what he's done and to keep reminding them of those truths. That's where the first thing that they'd done was that they'd forgotten the Lord. The second thing, verse 19, if you just look at that, at the end of verse 19, for you to forsake the Lord your God the fear of me is not in you. The people had stopped fearing God. In a sense, they'd stopped recognizing who God is. They'd stopped recognizing how different God is to all the other gods, in inverted commas, that exist in the world. The primary sin, as we see in, in this chapter, is the sin of idolatry. You know, that heart in people to want to worship. But when you stop telling the stories of who God is, when you stop reading the Bible and reminding yourself of, of how great God is, the, the human brain will always just move away and start to look at the world and start to think, well, maybe God's not that much different from the other things that people worship in the world. Maybe following Jesus isn't that much different. We need to remind ourselves of the truth. You know, when Moses was taking too long up the mountain, it says in Exodus 32, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Oh, make us gods who shall go before us. And then they melted all the gold down and made the golden calf. Something in the heart of, of people that we want to worship something. If we don't worship the living God, we will worship false gods or we will end up worshipping ourselves. 
we need to come and to remind ourselves of the good things that God has done. And their idolatry, it's likened to unfaithfulness in a marriage relationship. It's likened to becoming unclean. Verse 23, how can you say, I am not unclean, I have not gone up after the bowels? Even in their sin, they were still shocked, like, what do you mean we've done anything wrong? What do you mean we're, that we're worshipping other gods? You know, these things can be deceptive. There's a sense that people can, can think they're still worshipping God, even when they're worshipping God and other things. They can convince themselves that they're still being right before God. So when you look at King Solomon, his great downfall was marrying all these foreign women who dragged his heart away to, to worship in false gods. But Solomon never fully renounced the Lord. He never stopped serving God. He just added all these other things on, onto his service of God. You know, we can all do that. In, in different ways. Or we can worship the God, but we can, not the God, we can worship God, yeah? We can worship God in a worldly way, bringing certain techniques from the world and understandings from the world, allowing the world to come into the church. These things are a matter of, of our hearts. You know, we you can still come to church and live a double life and be serving all sorts of things, doing all sorts of things that are unclean before God. The Lord wants pure hearts. He wants undivided hearts. That was really the accusation that he was bringing against his people. Come back to me. Come back to me with an undivided heart. And the problem is, is that once we give our hearts over to false worship, we're dealing with a spiritual aspect here. Once you give yourself over to temptation, once you concede that, give yourself over to false worship, it can get a hold of you. And we see this vivid picture in verse 23. A wild donkey used to the wilderness in her heat sniffing the wind, who can restrain her lust? So a picture there of, of a donkey in heat. No one can stop her. There's no reasoning. It's just based on pure instinct. There's a desire within that animal to, to run after other animals. This is the problem with sin is that if we don't deal with sin, it can get a, a grip on us and it can lead us and it can drag us off into areas that we don't want to go. And there's a shamelessness as well. The, the accusation there in verse 26 is, A thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. They didn't even see that the, the, the shame within it. They were unashamed. But the issue is, is that Every sin that we fall into always brings shame. People might think it's, it's secret and hidden and it's going to be all right. No one will know. It's okay. It's not that bad, really. But it always brings shame. And this is the shame that the, that's brought out. Verse 27. Who say to a tree, this is where idolatry has led them. They say to a tree, you are my father. Just think about it. And to a stone, you gave me birth. Can you see what happens when we forsake the Lord and we go after other things? It brings a great shame. God's our Father. He's the one who brings us to birth, both physically and spiritually. There's also a sense of denial in, in Judah's sense um, defense here verse 17 have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way he's saying that this is your fault the troubles come because it's your fault but yet they're denying it there's also a sense of minimization you look at verse 22 
Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. You know, people often do this. They minimize sin and make it a superficial thing and think, well, if I just try and do this, if I, if I do some surface cosmetics, I'll be clean again. But the problem with human sin is that it's not on the surface. That was the problem with the Pharisees. that They were described as whitewashed tombs. They had it all clean on the outside. But yet inside it was full of dead men's bones. The problem of human sin can't be dealt with in a cosmetic way. It's right at the heart of us. That's why we need to be crucified in Christ. We need to die that the life of God might come forth in us. And there's even a sense of arrogance in their defense. As the Lord says in verse 5, What wrong did your fathers find in me? Or some translations I think, what iniquity, what uncleanness did you find in me? Can you see the arrogance of what they're saying? They're saying that it's all right you accusing us, God, but what about you? Are you so perfect? Now I've spoken with I can remember one conversation with an atheist particularly who, you know, trying to take the moral high ground and looking at the Old Testament and when, you know, God had sent them in to destroy all the enemies, including women and children. How can you serve a God like that? How can you respect a God like that? Do you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to put iniquity on God. Without realizing their, their own sin in that situation. Verse 34 says, Also on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. They're trying to say that God's unclean, when really they've got the blood on the skirts. And as we see, the sin of God's people oppressing the poor. But also, even worse than that, sacrificing their children to demons, as we'd read in that psalm earlier to Molech, to false gods as part of their idolatry. They had blood on their hands. We don't have the right to kill someone. But the author of life does. The one who gives life and the one who takes away life. The one who will bring judgment to, to all at the right time. We can't accuse God of doing wrong to excuse our sin. And yet many atheists will do exactly that thing to try and excuse what their sin before the Lord. Not only did they turn to idolatry, but the second sin really, which is tied in with idolatry, which we see in verses 14 to 19 and 33 to 37, is this desire within them to flirt with godless nations. Uh, verse 36, if you look at that, um, I'll read you the, the King James Version. It actually puts it as a question, but I just like the way it puts it. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Why did you go about gadding around, changing your way this way and that way? The heart of God's people was that now, now they'd unhitch them, themselves from the Lord. So who were they to turn to? Their hearts had gone after the idols. So what did they do? They start to look at the nations and think, oh, well, we're going to worship this God and we're going to trust in this nation to save us. They'd become fickle. There's this great battle between Egypt and Babylon at the time. Who shall we choose? Who's going to win the battle? Shall we side with the Egyptians or shall we side with the Babylonians? Who shall we choose? But like the broken system that can hold no water, when they come in the dry season, and they're desperate for a drink. And they lift the lid of the hole. And they look down. They see that the cistern's broken. That there were cracks in it. And the water's all drained away. As they put their trust in the idols. As they put their trust in their fellow man to help. There will be no help in times 
of trouble. Verse 28. But where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in your time of trouble. Verse 18. And now what do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Trusting in anything but God will always end in disappointment. It will always end in defeat. But the wonderful thing is, is that God always wins. And following Jesus may be hard, but it always, always brings satisfaction. Maybe not in this world. Perhaps the people here, they've become too worldly in their thinking. They were just thinking about the blessings of here and now in this earth. But we're not to think of those blessings. Ours is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And those blessings will come to us. But even if they don't, if they dry up for a season, it doesn't matter. Because we're seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. And we know some blessings that the world doesn't know about. So the people were in their forsaking of God were forsaking spiritual blessings. They were perhaps looking for earthly blessings, but they were actually forsaking spiritual blessings. So what had they cut themselves off from? Verse 31, God's question to them. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why then do you say to me, we are free we will come no more to you. So they're accusing God of bringing darkness to them. But Jesus declares himself to be the light of the world. The truth is the only place to find spiritual light doesn't matter what religion you go after. There is no spiritual light apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You go away from Jesus, the further you go, the deeper into darkness you will go. What about freedom? This is the great lie, isn't it? That if I can just be free of all religion, if I can be free, then, you know, it would just be great. But the truth is, this is the, the irony, really, is that freedom is only found by being a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason being is because when we're free, our freedom will lead us into sin and to bondage. There's only one way to be free from sin and bondage, and that's to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow him in everything that we do. So we see Jeremiah. He's a man where... Earthly blessings were stripped away from him. Famously in Jeremiah 38, they threw him into a dark, dirty cistern. There was no water in the system, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. He didn't have any freedom in that system system. Didn't have any light in that system. And it was dirty. But yet Jeremiah was clean and he was free and he had the light. He had a lot of trouble, Jeremiah. Chapter 20, it says that Pasha beat Jeremiah and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. You know, the world will try and throw accusations. I, don't, I presume they did it in the times of Judah, but they certainly did it in our days. In this, this nation, in the times of the stocks, they'd tie people up. And there'd be there, public humiliation. And when you s listen to Jeremiah's complaint after this, there's a sense of public humiliation. He's there at the Benjamin gate. People walking past him. Who knows what they threw at him as they went past to try and muddy him, to soil him, to dirty him. You know, when we stand up for righteousness, 
the world will throw all sorts of things at us, all sorts of accusations to coming at us. But Jeremiah was to learn, yes, he struggled, he did struggle, he was honest, and we can struggle with those accusations. But what's important is knowing what the Lord says to us. He says you're clean. When you're walking in obedience, it doesn't matter whether the world would turn it around and try and say you're dirty or you're the problem. You're not, you're the answer because you've been sent by God. You are clean and God will vindicate you and God will justify you because you're following the Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing that these people were missing out on was protection. Verse 14, is Israel a slave? Is he a home-born servant? Why then has he become a prey? What happens is, is that when people come away from the Lord's protection, when they try and join the world's game, it's a little bit like an ant on a rugby field. You're going to get trampled. You're going to get mauled. You've come away from the protection of the Lord. You know, sometimes the Lord will, if we are in sin and he wants to get our attention, he'll lift his protection from us so that things get bad, so that we get a taste, so that we get a scare, if nothing else, to run back to the shepherd for his protection. And we see how wonderfully, you know, you've got this fighting between Egypt and Babylon and Jeremiah through the, through the, the prophecy will be saying, look, yield to Babylon, to the people. Give in to Babylon, surrender to Babylon, and you'll be all right. Not because they were trusting in Babylon, but because God had sent Babylon, and it was, in a way, yielding to God. What do they, ref they do? They refuse to yield to Babylon, and they turn to Egypt and go away. Many of them get destroyed. Many of them get captured. But what happens to Jeremiah? Does he lose his protection? Well, when the Babylonians come into Jerusalem and destroy it, these are the orders that are given regarding Jeremiah. Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. The Lord protected his man. All these world empires swarming around. You'd had Assyria, you've got Babylon, the Egyptians, mighty world empires. Little Jeremiah is safe as houses because he's trusting in the Lord and the Lord's providing for him. The Lord will provide for you as we trust in him. So why all this forsaking? Well, interestingly, I think the heart of the matter is, is that they'd forsaken God and they'd turned into such gone into such idolatry because at the end of the day they weren't actually his people. In Jeremiah 31 it talks about the covenant, the new covenant. It says, this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after these days declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I'll write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. It's a bit more clear with Hosea. Hosea prophesying earlier, he prophesied both to Judah and to Israel before Israel went into exile. But he, he's told to marry a prostitute as a, sign, a prophetic sign to, to speak of, of Israel and Judah's unfaithfulness to God. And their second son, he says, The Lord said, Call his name Lo-Ami. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. The name Lo-Ami means not my people. That was the accusation that the Lord was bringing to his people. This apostate nation. Yes, there would have been some genuine believers in the nation, as Jeremiah was one. But they had to be people of faith. And that's the great lesson for us, is that, verse 21, it says, I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? So how had they degenerated? Well, the fact was, is that spiritual life can't be passed on through.
through human generations. Spiritual life has to come direct from God. You can't assume, this is why we're praying for prodigals. Many of our children have grown up in the church and then gone away. The question is, is were they ever there? Yes, they were in church, but were they ever there? Were they ever actually the Lord's people? You know, I'm, I don't think people here are presuming that their faith's going to carry their children in that way. And they know. I know by your prayers that you know that spiritual life can't be passed on. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean to say my children will be Christians. We've got to come ourselves to the Lord. We've got to receive it ourselves from the Lord. We have to be born again by the Spirit of God. It can't come through human generations. And that's why Ezekiel says in a similar vein, God says through him, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. These people needed the spirit of God. These people were described as not God's people. These people, as it says in verse 33, how well you direct your course to seek love. They were looking for love. How many people in our churches are looking for love in the wrong places? When you come to know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope you can witness with this. You don't go looking for love anywhere else. His love satisfies. His love is the greatest love. No one ever died for me. No one ever gave themselves up for me. No one ever loved me that much. Verse 5. What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? That's the sad thing. That God's people, their hearts were going the wrong way. They'd gone after worthlessness, after their idols. And in so doing, it become worthless. Verse 11 says, But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. So the contrast there is that the idols are described as worthlessness. But God is described as their glory. In idolatry, in sin, there's only shame and worthlessness. But in trusting in the Lord, in coming to the Lord, in coming to that fountain of life, we're coming to the glory, the glorious one. And we, we will be coming to glory. We'll be coming into the glorious one's presence one day to be glorified ourselves, to live in glory throughout the whole of eternity. Can you see how worthless it is? When people go away, why would you go away from the glory of God? Living in the glory of God, experiencing the glory of God. Isn't this what we as human beings were destined for? The greatest calling that anyone can have is to live in the glory of God. To be glorified with the glorious God. So to end... Where do you drink? There's only one place that gives water that satisfies. That fresh, refreshing, healing water. There's only one place where the water never runs dry. There's only one place that carries the blessings of heaven. There's only one source of water that can bring eternal life. Jesus is the fountain of living waters. And his promise still stands true. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Anything and everything else is merely 
cistern digging. 